So this morning, I know that we have experienced, for some of us, we have experienced something that we have never seen before, and that is war, in the way it's being portrayed. Uh, if you keep up with the news, you have heard the headlines that for the first time in 80 plus years, you have heard air, air um, sirens going off, announcing the imminent attack through bombing and, and missiles. So this morning, I think it would be appropriate for us to look at who God is and be reminded of who God is in light and despite of everything that is going on around us. So I'd like to bring your attention to the very first words of the Bible. And before we get into it, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come to you corporatively and individually. I pray as we continue to dive into your word this morning, Lord, may your spirit open our hearts and our ears and our eyes and our minds to just see you for who you really are. And we pray, Father, that that will help us in our walk with you. But not just that, but it will help us to have get a better glimpse of who you are and how you see us and how you treat us and how you care for us. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Very first words of the Bible. They are in the beginning, right? The Lord created the heavens and the earth. But what was it? These are the first words of the Bible, but what are the first words of God in the Bible? Let there be light. The very first words that, you, that is attributed to a deity in the Bible, and we know this for a fact that this is God, and as a matter of fact, it's not just God, it is the Holy Spirit and Jesus all together. Now, we know this, one, because the Spirit hovers over the waters, and in John chapter 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word was God, and through the Word the world was created, and without it nothing that was created was created. So we know that God created the heavens, and the earth. And so we, we, we attribute this characteristic of, of fatherhood because he created, Isaiah depicts this really well in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 18, and it says this, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. But are we really? Are we really the work of his hand? And not, not to say that this is false. In, in the context of what we're talking about, yes, Isaiah describes us being the clay and, and God being the, the potter, the one who controls and shapes us and forms us, right? Right? But do we really allow God to do that? Are we allowing God to mold us, to fashion us, into how he wants us to become? Do you want to be a skinny vase, or do you want to be a wide mouth vase? Do you want to be a tall vase? Do you want to be a short vase? Or are we, are, are we projecting our needs and desires before God projects his plans for us? The concept here is because he is the Father and he has that authority and he has that opportunity to mold us and shape us, Isaiah attributes this also as a characteristic of God being the Father. There's another element about God being as dressed as the Father. 
He communicated with the people about how he felt about his children. In Isaiah, excuse me, Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, it says, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my what? Firstborn son. I said to you, let my people go that, I, that he may worship me. Israel is my firstborn son. Portraying the, the figure, we're not going to get into the theological implications of all this. It's not the point of, of this message, but the idea is that God is portraying himself as the one who created those people, who designated those people, and is calling those, in, those people as his son, his children. And in the same manner that God is depicted as being the Father, you can't disassociate titles from humanities. Because here in Jeremiah, there is a vivid picture of who God is portrays himself to be in relationship to his children. In Jeremiah here, 31.9 says, I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Again, highlighting the language, but here, listen to what he says, even in prior chapters, in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 19. I'm going to share this with you from the Message Bible, because it, there is a poetic description of how he feels towards his own people. I plan what I'd say if you return to me. I mean, can you imagine, those of you that are parents, especially those of you that are dads, when you saw your first child being born, you started to think of all the plans in your head of how you wanted that child to succeed. For those of you that are moms, you fall in the same category. I'm not discriminating against you today. But when you see your first child come into the world, and your second and your third, the first thoughts that come to your mind is, you, you want that child to succeed. You want that child to thrive. You want that child to stay in a covenant relationship with you for the rest of your life. And so when you see this language, this is what God is, be, is beginning to say. How I, I, I have planned what I would say if you return to me. Implying that they had already left that relationship. This is the context. He says, good. And he, he, here's God thinking. This is what he would plan. Good, I'll bring you back into the family. And I'll give you the choice land. Land that is godless. That the godless nations would die for. And I imagine that you, what you would say. Have you ever imagined God having these kinds of dialogues within himself? As a parent, we can understand because when we see a child who... who sometimes disobeys. None of us here are perfect. All of us have fallen short at some point or another in a relationship as a son or a daughter. And now we get a, a sense, and now that we, as parents, we can understand this language. How the parent is yearning for that return of the of the child. He's not even he's not even asking here to return into an spiritual condition. He's just asking the pe people to come and return to a relationship, a personal relationship with God. But he continues. He says, "This is God imagining what the people would say to him. Dear father, and would never go again off and leave me. 
This is God's desire. That people would not leave his covenant relationship. Period. But no luck. Like a false-hearted woman walking out on her husband, you, the whole family of Israel, have proven false to me. God's decree. You know, there's, there's something to be said about a broken heart. I remember coming home the very first time I had my heart broken by a young lady. Late, young ladies, you probably can, you may, you could relate also. This is not about guys and girls. It's not men versus women. But you get, you catch my drift. Having your heart broken is not fun. And God is saying, you've broken my heart so many times, I have imagined for so long what I would say to you if only you'd come back. And he still says that. There are nearly 500,000 words in the Old Testament that in the Hebrew Bible. And there are only 15 occasions in which God is addressed as Father. But you compare that just in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have my Father written more than 51 times. So when you compare and contrast the difference between the Old Testament and the New, it's almost as if there's something interesting about to happen. Wesley Hill uh, wrote an article on Uh, Bible study magazine in September and October of 2020, and he says this, it's almost as if these rare instances of the God of Israel being called or calling himself Father are placeholders awaiting some unforeseen future revelation that will cause them to take on a new resonance. In other words, every time you see an idea of God being portrayed as a Father, there's something here that, that is about to happen, or should be happening. But then when you jump and you fast forward into the New Testament, now we have Jesus, and Jesus in all of these instances are Jesus is saying, my Father. The trouble with identifying God as a Father is that not all of us have been privileged to have a two-parent home. Some of us have grown up in single families where the father is absent. Some may have grown up where the mom is absent. Let me take a step farther. And there are some here who are growing up with an absent dad even though he's in the house. So when we depict God and we see God as the Father, it may bring about a bad taste to your mouth. Because we normally attribute the the characteristics of a father to God because of our personal experiences. So in order for us to understand a little bit better why Jesus called God as his Father. We know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that Jesus is the Son of God. But let's look a little bit closer. Let's go to John. I don't have this on the screen, but let's go to John chapter 14. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go there together. John chapter 14. And just so we're all together and we understand the context, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples and where he's sharing the last Passover meal with them. Jesus has just identified his betrayer and and is about to explain that Peter, and has just explained that Peter is going to deny him. And Peter, being brash, is like, no, no, me, I will, I will die for you. He's like, yeah, yeah, you, you will. 
you will. And after he has given them the commandment to love each other, and we, we touched on this here not too long ago, he says these words. Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. And if I go, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, and that where I am you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus, and if you have, and if you have known me, you have known the Father. You have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip, he said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Here's the verse. And Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and that the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Did you notice how many times the word belief is in there? I want, to go, I want to go back to the, the, the very first words here in the chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. This morning, some of you here have troubled hearts. You, trouble heart, you may have a troubled heart because of job insecurity. Or you may have a troubled heart because your family may be falling apart. Or you you may be having a troubled heart because of your marriage is falling apart. Or you have a troubled heart because of health concerns, personal health concerns. You may have a troubled heart because you're concerned with the political state of the world in which we live in. All of us have troubled hearts. All of us at some point are here because something's wrong. But Jesus' word is, let not your heart be troubled. So this morning I want to affirm you, let not your heart be troubled. But the focus of, of this message is not about you having your heart being filled with energy or filled with peace. Because the words that come out of Jesus' mouth is not to focus necessarily on being happy or being at peace. But he says this right after this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. See, the disciples had no problem understanding who God was. Jesus has spent three years ministering to them. And he has been telling them all this time long, listen, this is what's going to take place. The Bible has been clear that at the end of, the, uh, end of times, wars and rumors of wars are going to take place. Pestilence, diseases, sickness, illnesses, death, suffering, loss. That's going to happen. But let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why is it important to believe in Jesus? Because it is only through, excuse me, only through Jesus that we have access to the Father. It is only through Jesus that we can have peace in our heart. It is only through Jesus that we can come to Him and say, Lord, help. But 
but we struggle with that. We struggle because we are not the prodigal son. We are the older brother. Turn with me to Luke. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verses 25 through 32 is the end of this story. The story of the prodigal son has been told here before. Let me just give you the broad strokes. The youngest son who is unhappy at home has everything that he could ever want. Everything is provided for him. Everything that... Money could afford to him, it was, it, was, it was given. And he decides to ask his dad for his share of the inheritance. By the way, the oldest son would usually have twice the portion of everybody else. In other words, because there was only two, he would have two-thirds, and the youngest would have one-third. Keep this in mind, because when he goes and gets his inheritance, goes off and spends anything, and spends everything that he has, and is wondering if he should come back home, he does. I'm not going to dwell on the fact of what takes place, because we know that the father goes out and reaches, for, and reaches out to his youngest son on the way as he sees him from afar off. We get that story. We love that story. We love that image of the father who is coming in our direction when we become lost. But the reality is we're often like the youngest brother, like the oldest brother. Now his oldest brother who was on the feet in the field, verse 25, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he heard one of the servants and asked what, the thing, what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. They threw a party for him, a barbecue. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came and pleaded with him. And he answered and he said to his father, Lo, no, not you, Lo. Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours come, came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. Let me pause here. Remember that detail I said. He gave, he had twice the inheritance of the, his brother because he was the oldest. The father didn't say that, listen, I'm taking what's yours away from you. Notice that the father didn't say, it's, it's unfair, but you got to live with it. He just says, I am with you always. You have been with me. You haven't left. But what this insinuates is the fact that the oldest son never procured a relationship with the father, even though he sat at his table. When we look at the world today, and we look at the atrocities taking place, inside and outside our own homes, There are things that we can control and there are things that we cannot. The one thing we can control is the, is the status of our relationship. What's your relationship with the Father today look like? Do you sit at the table 
And do you complain that the person that walks through that door has been given grace? When all along you have been sitting here enjoying the grace that has been afforded to you and not understanding that that same grace has been given to you since the beginning. We are often like the oldest brother. And we fail to recognize God's goodness. Because we don't have a relationship with Him. And if we don't have a relationship with the Father, how are we going to be able to teach our kids that God is good and God is our Father? when we are not cultivating a relationship with our children. In Christ Objects Lessons, page 211, paragraph 1. In talking about the oldest brother, Ellen White describes this this way. It's true that our that you claim to be a child of God, but this claim to be this but if this claim is true, it is thy brother that was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He is bound to you by the closest tie, for God recognizes him as a son. Deny your relationship to him, and you show that you are that you are but a hireling in the household not a child of the family of God. What what she's saying here is, if we are sitting at the table, enjoying the benefits of God's good graces, but are angry with the ones that come through the door because they have been lost, you are a legalist. You are looking to earn salvation through your deeds, through your works. Because that's what the son did. The son was in the field, right? He was working for the father. And he's angry that he wasn't rewarded. That's the best definition of legalism that I can find. But that's not who the father is. The Father has been there all along. And He has even called us His children. In John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. You see, it's okay to be troubled and to have a troubled heart this morning because the world does not recognize you. Because if you are a child of God, the world is not going to recognize you. It didn't recognize Him and it didn't know Him The oldest son didn't recognize the father even though he sat at the table. So my question to you this this morning is this. Do you know the father? Do you have a relationship with him? Does your relationship with the father, is, is it such that you can emulate that with your children? That when you describe... God, as your father, you're able to explain why he is such a good dad. And you know what? It didn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if your house was broken. It doesn't matter if your your marriage is falling apart. God is still sitting at the table saying, I'm here. I see you. I understand everything that's going on. But as Jesus said, to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. You know that God created the world. You know that he can create everything out of nothing. But believe also in me. 
It's about your relationship with God. Focus on that. As you develop your relationship with God, He's going to unfold and pour out the the blessings in the storehouses. Let me just add this. I know this is a little bit out of context, but given the circumstances where we find ourselves in the world in which we find ourselves today, we need to pray more so than ever before. In the vision of God's storehouses, there were shelves with bags that were tied at the top. They were filled. And they had names underneath the shelves below each bag. So the question was asked, Lord, what are these blessings? What, what are these bags? And what do these names represent? And, and the Lord answered in this way. These bags are the blessing, are, are filled with the blessings I have for each person that they do not ask. If your heart is troubled this morning, bring it to God. Take it to Him in prayer. Take your family, take your household, take your relatives, take your country, take your leaders in prayer. We need our Father's love and blessings now more than ever. May God bless you.